Okay, looks like we're about uh, ready to start. The trickle from the hallways stopping. That break music was fun, wasn't it? Uh, I'm not supposed to say I've been in this business for a long time, but I have to say that T for the Tillerman came out when I was working on my first open source project. It was a while ago, and it wasn't a reissue either. So what I'd like to talk about today is chaos. Not the sort that we had here with the video adapters, but uh, numerical chaos. Uh, this is going to work better if I turn it on. Much better. Okay, so I'm Ted Dunning. I'm Chief Application Architect for MapR, but I also do a lot of open source work. For instance, I'm a very active mentor with the Killin project, which was the talk before this. Luke is doing a great thing there. And that's very exciting because that's the beginnings of Apache in China. It's largely a China-centric project. Uh, other things here, we have books at the MAPR booth that uh, my co-author, she's over here in the red and the black, so stylish, uh, will be signing that at the MAPR booth, but you can get them for free for downweight load in the lightweight edition, the PDF version. That series is about small solutions to key problems in machine learning, in time series database, things like that. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is about how to tell the best mathematician in the world he's wrong and have him believe you. That's the Monty Hall topic. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use randomized algorithms to solve really difficult things like searching in a geocoding setting. I'm going to talk about Thompson sampling. This is another way to use randomized algorithms that people are using right today to make billions of dollars. That's with a B. Uh, I'm going to show how randomized algorithms can make sounds sound better. That's being used ubiquitously in, say, consumer systems. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit about how synthetic data can be used as a surrogate for big data and how it can really, really help things, especially when security is a big deal. So let's going, get going. So the problem here, and this was the problem that was faced by some people, uh, some famous mathematicians uh, some many years ago. The problem really was, I mean, this is what uh, the Monty Hall problem is as it's described. You have three doors. There's a fabulous prize behind one of the doors. And this guy, Monty Hall, tries to make you pick a door other than the one you picked if you want to stick, or tries to stay with the door you have if you want to switch. He wants to add a lot of stress. See, there's the three doors in old, what, early Star Trek's television style. And presumably behind one of the doors is the fabulous untold wealth of the Orient or of Detroit, whichever it was. And this was something that people really, really wanted. And there would be a goat behind another door. Now, the problem is, how do you pick which door you want? Now, doing the math for how this actually works. The way it works is you pick a door, Monty shows you an empty door, and you can stand or you can switch. A lot of people have seen this problem. Doing the math isn't that hard, but getting the math wrong is even easier. And that's what happened. This famous mathematician, Paul Erdős, thousands of papers to his credit, walks in and solves problems that people had working on, been working on for years in just a moment. Well, he got this problem wrong. So the problem here, the real problem, the meta problem, is how would you do the computation that would give you enough confidence to tell Paul Erdős he got it wrong? And how would you convince him that he had made a mathematical error? And that's much harder than actually solving the problem. So let's do a little bit of live coding here with real chaos. So what we're going to do, actually, uh, we can do it live or we can do it with Memorex, either one. Let's start with live. Do we have anything? We don't have anything. There we go. OK. let's here. So what I've got here is R. R is a handy numerical tool. And I'm going to simulate the prize, the door. 
So the prize is going to be behind one of three doors. And so let's compute random numbers from one to three integers. Uh, I'm going to do that by multiplying a uniform random times three and taking the ceiling. It's, it's nice here when we use offset one. Here's the counts. We have a third of the samples behind door number one, behind door number two, and door number three. Now the problem here is completely symmetrical, so let's just take it that uh, we're going to pick our door is door number one, repeated 100,000 times as the others. Now, as we might expect, we will have picked the prize one third of the time. That's the mean of the number of, of the Boolean, which is our door is the prize. But let's continue on. Let's have Monty pick door number two to show us. That's a door different than the one we have, except that when the prize is equal to door number two, we will have Monty pick door number three. That's the basic idea of the problem. And do we ever have the case where Monty picks our door? No, he doesn't. Does he ever pick the prize? No, by design he doesn't pick that. Okay, now we have two strategies. One is a strategy of stand, and that means we just pick our door. And the strategy switch, we could switch to something other than our door, say door number two, except that we want to, wherever Monty picked door number two, let's pick door number three. So does the switch strategy ever pick Monty's door? Hello, here's the error. This is live coding, it's exciting. So does, so switching strategy never picks the door Monty does. Monty never picks the prize. Standing always picks door number one. Which is the better strategy, standing or switching? Well, the mean value of stand equal to the prize is one third. The mean value of switch is two thirds. So right there, with just a few numbers, just a few lines of code, we've simulated the problem and shown pretty definitively, as long as the 10 steps or so that we did replicate our understanding of the experience, those show us that switching is a far better answer. And that's exactly what that, that's exactly the argument, not necessarily with R, that convinced Powell Artish how to do this. But you could do that, right? You could build that simulation, try it out, build the same sort of thing. This is a thing that almost anybody here could do with the idea that you want to, uh, we need to get the slides back on, uh, with the idea that random numbers are a good way to compute. Certainly in this problem they are, but it, how special is that? Here's another example where random numbers are a great thing. So in geocoding, what we need to do is translate two-dimensional coordinates into a one-dimensional key. Databases often have a collation order, like HBase or MapRDB or Accumulo. These, they have a collation order so keys appear in some linear order. But space, at least the surface of the Earth, say, is two-dimensional. And you can't always reflect two dimensions in one dimension. The solution that people have come up with is to use what's called a space-filling curve. This is a curve that draws a line through all of space, and you can make that line go arbitrarily close to every point in a two-dimensional surface. But it now linearizes things. And the linearization is exciting. It, it puts a binary number on everything, and this is an alternative form of it. This is called Z-coding. It's not quite as efficient. And you can see that this square right there has an X value of, uh, I've got X and Y mixed up here, but 0, 1, 0, that's the vertical axis, and Y is the second one is 0, 1, 1. 
And so we interleave the bits of x and y to get 0, 0. That's the first bit. Those are the leading bits. 1, 1, those are the second bits of x and y. And 0, 1, which are the third bits. Now we can encode different points that are close together and mostly, often, points that are close together in the surface wind up close together in the encodings. So here's the encodings of those three places on the map here. And you can see that two of them wind up close together, one of them winds up far apart. Okay, so Z coding is nice for building uh, database keys, but watch what we can do. If you wanted to say, pick all the points that are nearby that point that we had before, it's a difficult problem. It's difficult because the Z encoding really scrambles things up. And so it's very easy to implement Z coding from the surface location to the Z code very accurately. But doing the reverse is a little bit harder. And more importantly, doing the approximate reverse is quite difficult to get right. It's not super difficult as algorithms go. But what we can do is we can take our original point and spray around it. And then just forward Z code all of the results. We get results that are according to these colors. And that gives us a probabilistic estimate of what codes are close to our original point using only the forward Z code. This is a terrifically simple thing to do. And in fact, we can, we can go further. We can notice that 0011, which is down here, there's exactly one point. So it's very rare. So it's not very close. And the rest of them can be encoded as ranges. And now we have a query for a linear database that does approximate geographical searching. In just reasonably a few lines of code, which include adding a random number to your original point of the scale that you want to search, and then z-coding all of those results. You can probably do it in one line in Python, or Scala, or something with list comprehensions. And so here's another example of how a random algorithm, how using random numbers in an algorithm, massively simplifies it. Now, it simplifies it, and that has a couple different uh, factors. One is that it makes us much more confident of our solution. It makes it much easier to come up with a solution. So we, we see some values here. Here's another example. This is something you hear every day, or rather something you don't hear every day. And that's the point. Here's a sine wave. It's a four-bit sine wave. Listen to the end. You hear that nasty, nasty disturbance at the end? What's happening there? is that the quantization, it's a pure sine wave, but after quantization, you hear harmonics going <laughs> Sounds like you know Tibetan drones or something like that. But here, watch this. By adding just a few random numbers, it sounds like a very pure tone. It's still only four bits. There's a hiss. We've turned that quantization error into randomized hissing. And we can hear this tone go all the way down, as opposed to stopping suddenly when it gets down to one, less than one bit. And here is a version where the noise is shaped, so it's a little bit here, easier to hear the tone. Almost no distortion left. All we've done is add random noise to the signal. It's still a four-bit signal, but now we have a nearly pure tone. So here's another example of a randomized algorithm which changes something almost miraculously. We start with a tone that looks like this. It's heavily, heavily digitized. We add random noise that looks like this that's triangularly shaped. And so what we wind up with is samples that oscillate between two available codes. And the average then is a very, very, very smooth sine wave of the sort that we want. Three examples already. Three examples that you could implement in just a very few lines of code and whose correctness you can hear or you can see or you can feel. Here's a more advanced one. This is called Thompson sampling. And the problem here is in the real world, when we do machine learning, we often get to pick which things we learn about, which things we think might be good 
And we also get to pick not to learn about things that we already are sure are bad, for whatever good or bad might mean. What this means is that, in general, learning has the cost of picking the right one or picking the wrong one. Picking the wrong one is lesser value. Picking the right one is higher value. But we can never find out what the better or the worse options are unless we pick all of the options. This, this makes it really hard to do the learning without invoking some cost. The cost of picking the worse options in order to learn about them so that we find out which the best is. And so that gives us a quantity we call regret. We can't know what it is, but it's the amount by which the mean value of the one we do pick is less than the best possible. So the, the problem here is to learn as fast as possible with as little regret as possible. We can't just sample all the options and leave it that way for some period of time because very, very quickly often, suboptimal things become apparent. We have to learn very quickly. We can't do it with t-tests and things like that because that has no idea of cost embedded in it. So here's a demo. We have five options of different colors. Each one has some payoff uh, that is randomized. It's like coin, flipping a coin. And if we pick a bad option, we have regret. And the best known algorithm actually uses randomization. And here's a demo of that. What we have here are three graphs. The top graph shows us our current estimates of the payoff of five options, purple, blue, green, yellow, and red. The middle graph shows how much bandwidth is being given to each option. And as we go forward in time, you can see that it's changing the amount that it provides to each one. Now, we've provided a few samples of purple, and they all failed. So we now have a very broad, but broadly negative opinion of purple. We've given two trials to, to one trial to yellow, and it succeeded. So we have a broadly positive view of yellow. So already, the system is giving half the bandwidth to yellow. It says that's good enough to start emphasizing yellow and decreasing regret. Now, we can't really know what regret is, but the simulation knows. And if we keep going, look at this. Yellow has had several tries. It's now up to 70%, and regret has been cut in half at 15 steps into there. If we continue on, we now have an estimate of red being slightly worse than yellow, but still with very high estimates. The system knows what it knows, and it knows what it doesn't. It encodes knowledge and ignorance in the same model. And purple and blue and green uh, are all known to be losers, and you can see in the middle graph that they're getting hardly any bandwidth. Only red and yellow are getting any significant bandwidth, and right now the system is wrong. It thinks that red is worse than yellow, which is wrong. But very quickly, the, the randomization figures out what the right answer is. There'll be some switching back and forth as red and yellow duke it out. But this system learns very quickly, and it most importantly learns to get rid of the losers very, very quickly. So it's spending all of the opportunities it has to learn on only the best things. And the way it does this is it uses randomized algorithms. It has a current estimate of what the distribution for red is. It takes a sample from that, not an estimate. It takes a sample from yellow. The yellow estimate might be higher than the red, might be worse. Whichever one is the highest is the one we try for this trial. That's it. It's a five-line algorithm. And it is the best known algorithm there is. Best in a couple of senses. Best first in the sense of reaching the asymptotic theoretical best regret bounds, but also best in terms of it is by far the simplest algorithm known to solve this problem. And so there's another randomized algorithm. And then here's my last one, which is fake it. Literally, fake data is a randomized algorithm which is actually very, very important. So we had a problem. We had a customer, a very large insurance company. And they came to us and they said, Hive is broken. This is what customers do. They say something's broken. 
and they give you no details. This is quite typical, but it's part of life. And so we said, can you tell us more? Can you send us stack traces? The answer was no, because the stack traces might have private information. Okay, well, that's the correct answer. Can we see the data? The answer was no. Can we see the query? Yes, and here's the query. Do you see the problem? Maybe the problem's on the second page, or the third page, or the five pages beyond this, which I neglected to put into the slideshow. Well, it's hard to see what the problem is here. It's a big query, and it's complicated. It's hard to even see where the subqueries are and where the query is. If you look at the explain plan on this, you get bigger pages of output that make no sense to a human looking at them. So how are we going to fix this problem? Customer has a real problem. This failed on their data that we can't see. We have to fix this somehow. So one tack on this is they can give us a summary of the data. They can tell us how many columns, how many rows, what types there are, and maybe even some summaries, statistical summaries. For instance, this is an integer. Is the distribution even or skewed? What's the minimum? What's the maximum? How many distinct values are there? That is not a violation of HIPAA. That is an aggregate that they can tell us. How many different names are there? Are the counts of how often those names occur skewed? That's enough for us to build data that looks a lot like the original. So what we can do is we can take the original data here on the upper left, and we can summarize that. And based on the summary, we can come up with parameters for random number generators that give us fake data that the customer can then confirm breaks Hive in exactly the same way. They can then give us the summary, and we can build our own fake data. All they give us are the parameters of the random distributions, the schema of the database. Now, there are customers we have which can't even tell us that. And that, that's a whole nother ball of wax. But in this case, this solved the problem. We built several billion rows of random data, ran the query, and it failed exactly the same way it did in the customer site. We were able to fix it. Now, I'm going to talk at another talk about elaborating this particular example, how we can not only do this for bug tracking, but how we can do secure machine learning where the people developing the algorithms and building the models can't even see the data that they are trying to build the models on and build the new kinds of algorithms. But I think you can see here overall with, what, four or five examples, mind-numbingly many, that random numbers are one of the coolest things you can compute with and probably not one of the things people talk about much. You also need some fancy distributions a little bit, but it's not that hard to do. There's, there's code that I have an open source, uh, log synth, it's a little tiny package, generates very realistic random numbers. Random numbers that look like names. Random numbers that look like vehicle identification numbers complete with factory and engine type and things like that. So it's something that anyone here can do to solve these kinds of problems. I think random numbers are very cool. Now, again, reminding you, we have books at the MAPR booth, several of them. Uh, there's four out so far. And I'd love to hear some questions or some comments or suggestions about how you could use random numbers like this, or how what I've said is totally off base, or how it's unclear and might want to clarify it now. We have 15 minutes for questions. If you could step to the uh, microphone, then I'll be able to hear you, and so will everybody else. Yeah, here's a, either a refugee or a questionnaire. Any questions on this? Has anybody here tried randomized algorithms of this sort? Yeah, so there's all the people who do randomized algorithms, except this guy, sit in the back. There's, there's, a, there's a pattern here. I don't know what it means. We'll have to simulate it. Anybody here have data that they could use randomized algorithms on? Anybody had customers come up with weird shit? Nobody here. This guy's the only one who has weird customers. Oh, there's another one. Thank you. Oof, couldn't see you in the light here. 
Uh, how about uh, people who have had problems where the customer had a security issue and couldn't give you all the data? Anybody with customers? Yeah, same guy. He, he's got all the same problems I do. I've got a question. Oh, great. Thank you. So I, I uh, tried to understand the problem, uh, so just uh, the description. I have a high-level question, though. So I mean, you're trying to, we're trying to solve a problem by using randomization, right? But randomization, perfect randomization itself is a hard problem. So are, are we like trying to move, are we trying to move problem to somewhere else? Well, you ask, you, you, in your question, you say randomization is a hard problem. Like generating random data itself is a hard problem. Well, actually, no. Uh, there are hard ways to generate random data, and that typically applies where you have some mathematical constraint on the distribution, but not on the actual parameters of the distribution itself. In those cases, you may need some pretty advanced mathematics to generate good random data. But for most applications, for the applications in security, in fraud, in dithering of this sort, random algorithms are really as easy as what we saw, if we could switch back to the display here. There are built-in uh, primitives. Is there somebody back at the AV? Well, I guess not, he disappeared. Uh, oh, there he is, he disappeared behind the monitor. There we go. So here, for instance, with one procedure call, I can get 10 random numbers. These are of particular distribution. These are uniformly distributed. So if we do a histogram of 10,000 of those, see it's very even. But watch what happens. We can do all kinds of clever things. Here's the difference between two random numbers. And now we have that triangular distribution that we used for the dithering on the south. So it really isn't hard to generate random numbers. And you saw me generate the random numbers for the Monty Hall problem. That had intricate cases, like I generate a prize uniformly, I pick a door. Monty Hall picks a door that is not mine and is not the prize. We have if then else kind of logic in there. But it turns out really simple to do. In practice, it can be very, very easy. And I think the real idea here is that the perception is it's hard, it's mathy, things like that. And the, the reality is it's really pretty easy in important cases. I have a comment, though. It's very nice to see that how, how it relates. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an under underdeveloped skill that people need. There you uh, Hi. Uh, familiar what, face. Yeah, I did. Uh, what, what did you do to ask a customer um, what are the statistics of the shape of your data to make it easier for them? Because obviously they're not gonna know right off the bat. Well, um, they actually were sophisticated SAS users. Uh -huh. So the first thing we did is ask for a SAS data set summary. Uh, and that okay. gives us a lot. That tells us what type of data is it. We also asked for a, a, my, uh, a, a SQL schema because the system was originally coming off of a data warehouse. And that tells us uh, especially if you can get statistics with that, how many values there are and what sort of skew there is. But mostly, mm. what type is it, how many values distinct are there, and how much skew in the counts. Right. From okay. there, you can do a lot. Covariances are important in some cases, especially where you have intricate joins, but remarkably rarely, mm. which is fabulous. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Just talk and he'll, he'll make it so. Okay, so, so my question is on, um, in your examples, you looks like you're using uni uniform random you know, distributions, right? But in reality, I think you need to know the underlying probability distributions before you can even generate the, the random number, right? Well, in the particular example that I live coded, uh, I used uniform randoms, but that, that was live, <laughs> dude, that's scary. Uh, here, for instance, if we zip over, to, uh, I don't have it open, but uh, no, you do need to use more sophisticated random number distributions than uniform in many cases. You may need to use a non-parametric distribution. You may need to use something that has m a mixture of notionally infinite number of things. But there are well-known techniques that to do this, uh, 
Right. There are well-known techniques for building non-uniform word distributions or addresses or things like that. I've collected those in a package called LogSynth, L-O-G-S-Y-N-T-H, that's available on GitHub. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking about that, you know, in a, to solve this generally, do you require some types of like um, graphical model to understand the, uh, the relationship between these underlying factors that interdepend on each other? Remarkably, uh, so, so graphical models are a particular form of uh, not a random distribution, but a way of describing random variables and dependent distributions that are very general for Bayesian modeling in general, right. but are not necessary for most of the practical applications of the sort that I'm talking about. They are necessary if you want to do Bayesian reasoning right. on large-scale data. That's not what we're doing here. We're completely faking it. And all we're trying to do is emulate a failure. That's a much simpler problem. Right, right. Now, th this other talk that I have talks specifically about how to generate those random numbers. And I show examples. And so you should come to that, and we can talk details there. Okay, great. But Thank this, you. I am purposely, and the point of this is to carve off a very practically important part of the problem, which is stupidly simple. Okay. Everybody has the impression that the hard part right next to it pervades everything. But in fact, there's a huge range of application where you can do really, really simple stuff. Great. And get high value. Thank you. Like we kept our customer. Yeah. So last year at the SAS conference, uh, the speaker came out, uh, he was the main uh, uh, architect of the SAS uh, software, and he says, I have the magic trick. It's called oversampling. Oversampling? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is it something similar to what you're talking about, or is it uh, completely different? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not familiar with the particular term uh, specifically that you're talking about there. There are a number of sampling tricks that you can use to make statistical analysis much easier. They can be resampling. You can sample larger than the data that you actually wanted to collect so that you can have fallouts uh, that, that let you fall into uh, solutions in particular points. Uh, but I don't know the details of what he was talking about. But it sounds much more like a statistical inference problem than a pragmatic software engineering solution. So I've got some customers with weird shit. Um, and obviously would like to keep them, right? Yeah. Um, I'm also in a position where I haven't been particularly close to statistics in, let's call it a few years. Um, are, is the ebook that you've referred us to, as well as Log Synth and some of the other um, references, a good place to revisit to figure out how to begin to apply some randomization to both our, our testing techniques as well as our troubleshooting for our clients? No, we don't have a small book on that yet. Uh, Ellen's busy taking notes. We may soon have one. Uh, By the, the end of this me, session, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the readme on LogSynth is interminable with lots and lots of examples. I'm going to have to break it out into a full-blown wiki. But it has lots of examples of how you can generate realistic data. And this is a simple technique that anybody can get used to. It isn't really PhD work or math or statistics. It's really much simpler. And so just pop over. You can also send me an email where we can talk. OK. I think we have one minute left. And I'd like to ask another, have another, I'd like to answer another question, ask. This is probably a quick question, too. Uh, are there like uh, come closer to the microphone yeah uh, to um, if you look at the your hypothesis right you're trying to solve the problem uh, say that adding randomization we can solve the problem is there do you have like a proof uh, we have like you have talked about like examples and uh, quant quantitatively you have talked but are there any uh, like proofs that uh, we can reduce the problem or solve a problem like this tools uh, uh, no, uh, proof to say, uh, ah. pr like, th theoretically. So, yes, there are pragmatic proofs that these, these uh, are useful. Now, they come into two flavors. One is you actually solve the problem, find a bug. That's easy, right? You solve the bug. That's the proof of the utility of the method at that point. 
a more subtle proof is when you can actually develop machine learning algorithms. And you can prove two things. One, it's that this is impossible in general. And two, that whenever it does work, whenever you can find uh, spectrum matching, that's the sort of techniques that we're using, uh, distributions, that you will have the same sorts of results. Now, it's just a pragmatic observation that this is useful. And I'm a pragmatic kind of guy, so that fits me pretty well. So, thank you. Uh, the man is doing the, the fancy head him up, move him out motion. Thanks very much. I'm going to be available for more questions.